Well, good morning again, everybody. We did miss you. I was on vacation last Sunday, but it was good to be back. Um, if you're new around here, please know my name is Bart. Uh, I'm one of the ministers here, and it's just nice to meet you. Imagine with me, okay? You all have great imaginations. Imagine in your head that it's May of 1940, and the British Army is trapped on the beach of Dunkirk. Now, Dunkirk is located on the coast of France, and over 338,000 soldiers are trapped there and are about to be annihilated. Now, they, they have been on retreat because the Nazi army, army has been on the attack. The Nazi army has been raging war, and they've been winning all over Europe. So they are literally no way out for these 338,000 soldiers. They're stuck. And even the prime minister... Winston Churchill of England sent a memo to British Parliament gearing up for what he called the annihilation of the British Army. For these soldiers were the last line of defense between England and the invasion of the German force. Then on May 24th, Hitler issues this puzzling order. This order still puzzles historians to this day of why Hitler would do this. And in this order was to his generals that they had to stop. It was an all-stop order. Stop their assault. For no one has any idea why Hitler would place such an order because they were advancing easily everywhere they went and winning everywhere they wanted to go. And history has shown that this one order changed the outcome of the entire war. So the German tanks division stopped just about 10 miles outside of Dunkirk. And then all of a sudden, the city was then covered in this very strange mist that prevented the German Air Force to see anything on the ground. And this mist was a combination of, of, of fog and smoke, and it gave cover to all the soldiers that were on the beach that were sitting ducks, and it stopped the aerial attack. And even stranger still, the English Channel, which is known for having high winds and dangerous and choppy water, was perfectly calm for three full days. One historian called, says that it was like bath water. Not like my son's bath water, but bath water. So this made it possible for thousands of small civilian boats to cross the channel and rescue all 338,000 soldiers from annihilation. Now, this story has, was made famous by the Christopher Nolan movie called Dunkirk when it was released several years ago. And when the movie came out, a friend and I went to go see it, and it was just amazing and terrifying to think of what could have happened and see what actually happened. But what's not in the film is something of, of high and big significance. Very early on that Friday morning on May 24th, King George called the nation to something. King George, upon hearing uh, upon the, the possible annihilation of the British army and the invasion of the German forces on British soil, called the nation to a day of prayer and fasting. And so here is the old grainy picture of Westminster Abbey in central London on the day of prayer and fasting for Dunkirk, when thousands of people lined up outside, waiting their turn for a few moments to, to plead with God for his mercy and help. Now, this was just hours after the king had called the nation to pray and fast. A few hours into that day, interesting things started to happen. Hitler ordered the tank division to stop. The mist covered Dunkirk. The, the English Channel calmed down enough for the civilian boats to cross it and rescue all 338,000 tro troops that were saved that day. The outcome changed the war. Before that, Hitler was marching through Europe with what seemingly be like supernatural powers. But then things changed after Dunkirk. For the World War II generation does not call this Dunkirk or the Battle of Dunkirk. The World War II generation and some historians for several decades referred to this as the miracle of Dunkirk. So was this a miracle or just plain luck? 
I mean, was God, God, was this God's response to prayer and fasting or just a bad military move by a power hungry dictator at the head of a nation? I would lean on the side of miracle. I would say without hesitation that this was the God's powerful response to his church praying and fasting. And for I believe that this is a good example of what happens when the church, God's church, is unleashed. This is what happens when God's people pray and fast. For our God is still the God of miracles. And he wants to do a miracle today. And I don't know about you, but when I look around in our culture, we need some miracles in our society today. Amen? I mean, just think about what happened last night with the shooting that happened in Exit 49 and the chaos of all that and the fear that we have now. Think about the continual war that goes on in Ukraine and in the Holy Land and the school shooting that happened in Georgia this past week and the sickness that is everywhere and that we're at an all-time high of people that are struggling with depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts. We have more marriages that are struggling, more families that are struggling, more people that are struggling. And I believe we need a miracle. And I believe that with all of my heart that this miracle is something that God wants to do, but is waiting on his church to unleash that power. And I believe that this power can be unleashed when we pray and fast. And don't miss this. God is waiting to do a miracle here. And in your life, But he is waiting to do that for us. He's waiting on us to pray and fast. For the Bible shows that when God's people pray and fast, God does something big and amazing. In Nehemiah 1 verse 4, it says, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. This is when Nehemiah discovered that Jerusalem was just in shambles. For some days I mourned and what? fasted, and prayed before the God of heaven. And then after that, Nehemiah was able to go and rebuild the whole city and help the people. In Acts 13, Barnabas and Saul, they go on, on, on a military, or military, listen to me, missionary journey. But before they go, that something happened. In verse 2, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. In verse 3 it says, For after they had fasted and what? Prayed. They placed their hands on them and sent them out. And the first part part of verse 4 I love. It says this, And the two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit. Oh, isn't that good? I mean, I would submit to you that we as the church need to be sent more on our way by the Holy Spirit. But this is how Barnabas and Saul were able to reach people with the unleashed power for the sake of Christ. They became missionaries and on this missionary journey. And because of those missionary journeys, billions of people were saved, come to Christ, and we're able to be a church today because of that. Do you understand the, the implications of all this? And so it all comes back to praying and fasting. It's like the power of God is unleashed when we pray and fast. Praying and fasting are the powerful practices that unleash both God's voice to us and our voice to God. But for so many Christians, the two scariest words are prayer and fasting. Have you noticed that? I mean, the two scariest words are prayer and fasting. Let me illustrate this. You all know I was a youth minister a few years ago. We won't talk about how long ago. But when I was a youth minister, it was so funny because I knew every single teen that was in my youth group, which there was a lot, but they always had this fear. I would say this one simple phrase, and they would get really uncomfortable and kind of fearful, and they would get quiet, and they would all look down. And do you know what that phrase was? Okay, who wants to pray? You ever notice that? You ever have a big group of teenagers? All you have to do is, hey, who wants to pray? And they're all quiet and they look down. Why? Because they're scared. They're scared to pray out loud. Now, I'll be honest. I've been in adult ministry for some time now, too. And some adults are this way. I mean, especially to pray out loud, but but we're scared to pray. We're scared of almost the word, it seems like. 
we oftentimes think something like, well, I don't want to pray out loud. Or what if I say the wrong thing? Or what if, what if I don't do it right? Or are, I mean, are my prayers even being heard? I mean, it feels like sometimes that they aren't even making it past the ceiling of my room when I pray. I mean, God knows everything anyway. So do I really need to pray? For we have so many reasons to not only not to pray, but also to be scared of prayer. And it's the same with fasting. I mean, anytime that I talk to a fellow Christian, even mature Christians, and I'll ask them about, have they ever fasted before? Their body language gets kind of weird. <laughs> and their answers are usually like, uh, kind of. I've fasted before. I mean, kind of because I, I tried it until I got hungry and then I ate. It's kind of like, that's not really fasting. <laughs> or they will respond, no, that's an Old Testament thing. Or I can't really do that. Or I don't know what to do, so I won't do it. I mean, it's like we're kind of scared to even try it. But I would suggest to you all today that when we combine these two of prayer and fasting, there is this special chemical reaction that unleashes the power of God in our lives. For we can pray without fasting and we can fast without praying, but when you combine the two, then it unleashes the power and presence of God. And please hear me for what I'm actually saying. It's that if we want this power unleashed in our life, in our family, in our work, in our school, in our home, in our church, in our city, in our world, then there is just something when we combine prayer and fasting together. So I want to help you all basically reduce your fear factor when it comes to these words, just by diving into them for just one second. Prayer should not really be a scary word at all. It's really a general term that the Bible uses that, that the way we kind of define prayer is that we communicate and commune with God. That's what it really means to pray. Is it's when we communicate, which means when we talk to God and when we listen to God, and when we also commune with God, which means we have fellowship with Him. We tell Him about our day. We tell Him how we're feeling. And we connect with Him because we want to connect. He wants to connect with us. It's like we spend quality time with him because the most important relationship we have is with him. And all prayer can be broken down in two categories. I know this is an oversimplification, but it's listening to God and speaking to God. Those are the two main categories of prayer. That's prayer kind of in a nutshell. You see why it shouldn't be fear, we shouldn't be fearful about it? Now, fasting should not be a scary word either. Fasting is a way to hear from God and, and to hear God. So fasting means that we take something away from our life to spend more time with God. It's the spiritual discipline that literally says that we, we disconnect something from the world to connect with God. So we stop doing something to do more things with God. I like to think of it this way. I like to define it this way. It's to unplug fr some, from something of the world to plug more into God. It's like we give up something, we stop doing something of the world, and then use that time that we would use for that thing to connect to God in prayer, reading scripture, worship, silence, all those kinds of things. And biblical fasting usually refers to, to not having food, kind of taking away food for a certain amount of time. But we also teach here that can also be withholding something else kind of like getting off social media for a week. I mean, don't we all kind of need to do that? Let's be honest. Or, or giving up just screen time in general. Or doing something like that that we know we need to do to unplug from so we can plug more into God. And please understand that whatever you give up, you need to fill that time that you would normally use that, that thing for with God things. Because if you do not fill that, fill that time with something of God, then you're just dieting. <laughs> It's not, it's not anything spiritual. And fasting is not a diet, but it's the feasting on of the things of God. Prayer and fasting are where we emphasize communication with God, connection with God, and giving up something of the world to connect better to God. And this is why tonight, as a church, we launch a special emphasis on prayer and fasting. It's called the Week of Prayer. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this later tonight at 7 so I want to invite everybody to come. This is where we take seven days where we are more focused and more intentional and more intensive on our prayer lives. 
where we pray for one another at another level to communicate with God because we're praying for one another. We're praying for our homes and our families. We're praying for our community. We're praying for our church, our nation. We're praying for the world. And I just want to encourage everyone to come tonight to day one because the prayer service, I'm telling you, if you've never come, you're missing out. It is amazing. It's at 7 o'clock tonight here, and the kids are even going to have their own prayer service so it's, we're going to have this worship time. We're going to dive into the word, but we're also going to step into spiritual warfare. And this is the time that we can draw close to God, and we know that he will draw close to us. And let me just tell you from experience, God shows up. God shows up in a big way, and I hope you will too. So come tonight. Now, when it comes to the subject of prayer and fasting, there is usually a question that I think a lot of people ponder but don't want to share it out loud. I think there's a question that we don't like to verbalize, and it's simply this. Why pray and fast? Why should we pray if God already knows everything? Why should I fast because I don't really want to go hungry? I mean, why should we pray and fast? And I think that's a, that's a valid question. And that's what I kind of want to help answer for you today. And I want to give you two reasons of why we pray and fast, and it's found in Acts chapter 13. We'll start in verse 1 this time. It says, Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaean. Which I guess that's how you say his name. I don't really know. I just want to do it confidently to make you think I knew what I was saying. Anyway, uh, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Paul for the work to which I have called them. In verse 3, So after they had prayed and fasted, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Now I want you to notice the first reason of why we pray and fast. And it's found in verse 2. And it's this. See, we pray and fast because we can hear from God better. We can hear from God. Because what I know about you, most of you here today, what I know about what most of the people online and most everybody else around here and even the people back then is that we want to hear from God. I mean, let's just take a quick bowl. How many of you all would like to hear from God today about your life? Anybody raise your hand? Yeah, we all would. It's this thing, but it's as we are praying and fasting, all of a sudden the voice of God becomes clear and gives clear direction. This has been my experience with praying and fasting and so many other experiences of other followers of Jesus. In times of prayer and fasting and waiting on God's voice and direction, then all of a sudden we hear God's voice clearer. Just like this last month, one of my dearest friends that lives in Lexington, a friend of mine, he had this big decision to be made about his business. He was huge. I mean, he was telling me about it. It was a 30-minute conversation just about his business. And he didn't know what to do. So he prayed and fasted for three days. And then all of a sudden on day three, a solution came to his mind. And on that same day, he got a random phone call from one of his other friends that suggested the same idea that popped into his head. And isn't it funny just how God works sometimes? And he took that as God's voice and direction over his life and over his work. And it was while he was praying and fasting. And this is just one of so many other stories just like it. So why is that? Why is it that all of a sudden we can hear God clearer, hear his voice clearer when we pray and fast? Well, let's dive into that real quick. First, let's talk about prayer. You see, when you pray, you are focusing on communication and communion with God. And then when we add the fasting part, it helps change us. So when we pray and fast, it's like we're chipping away at the battle that is seen and unseen or the physical and the spiritual. And for we do not exist in separate categories. And you all know this. We talked about this in the last sermon series. We are at war. We just need to understand that. We are in a battle with the seen and the unseen, and we have to step up and stand firm. So how do we do that? Pray and fast. But what we need to understand about us as human beings, though, is that we exist as a whole being. We're not just separate categories in the sense of, you know, I'm an emotional being one day, and the next day I'm a mental being, and the next day I'm a spiritual being. 
And the next day, I'm a physical being. No, it's just us. Have you ever noticed that? That we are just the entire being. We're, we're all of those. We're physical and emotional and mental. And, well, some of us are more mental than others. But anyway, but we're just this whole being. And it's when we pray and fast that this is one of the few things that we can do in life that will affect our entire being for the better. But let me talk spirit, like specifically about fasting for a second. Because there are so many things out there about fasting that I don't think we truly understand. The first thing we need to understand about fasting is that it helps us physically. Science has proven that when we fast, that it increases the blood flow to our brains, and I need as much help as I can get. What about you? That helps us be more alert and aware compared to when we eat. Because when we eat, I'm sure you know this, but when we eat, the brain sends blood down to our digestive system to process the food we've eaten. And this is why, especially when you eat a big meal like Thanksgiving dinner, you want to go take a nap and, are, and you're pretty much useless. I mean, no one has eaten a big Thanksgiving dinner and gone, you know what, let's go do calculus, right? <laughs> Nobody has, even mathematicians don't. It's because your blood is down in your belly. And fasting also increases the functioning of our brain, the neuroplasticity of your brain, if you want to know the scientific term. I just want to impress you all for a second there. But also fasting decreases anxiety and depression while elevating calm and a sense of well-being. In some case studies, fasting has stopped or even reversed some of the the effects of Alzheimer's disease and other memory-related disorders. Plus, We can see this in our culture that has accepted the power of intermittent fasting and the benefits of intermittent fasting. For intermittent fasting can help you lose weight and helps your overall health. And another benefit of fasting from food is that you realize just how much time and energy goes into food. Have you ever thought about this before? All the time that you spent meal planning or spending time after church trying to decide what you're going to do for lunch, right? When you go to the grocery store, you cook, you eat, you order off the menu, you walk, talk, and clean up. Fasting from food all of a sudden gives you all that time in your day to spend more time with God. Priscilla Shire says it this way. I'm able to gain perspective on how unbalanced is the amount of time, energy, and effort that I put into my body versus my spirit. She goes on to say, I'm going to leave that first quote up there. When we choose to sacrifice a need of the body to place more importance on the need of the spirit, then God himself sits up and takes notice. The heavens are open to us in a way that might not have been otherwise been. Fasting puts us in the ideal position to listen and put, puts God in the ideal position to speak. For fasting and praying does wonders for us. It helps us hear God better. Or even the prophet Joel says this in Joel 2, 12. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. And notice that phrase, with all your heart. With fasting and weeping and mourning. Because we know this in Jeremiah 29, 13. That Jeremiah says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Now, Jeremiah is saying, he doesn't specifically talk about fasting, but he uses the phrase, with all your heart. And if you seek God with all your heart, then you will find God, and he will find you. And fasting is one of those ways that we seek God, not with just a little bit of our heart, but with all of our heart. And when we seek God with all of our heart, then we will find him. And parents, you understand this. You you understand that if, if your kid comes into the room and says, hey, mom or dad, can I have this or that? Compared to kids that come in and say, mom or dad, I am so thankful for you. I love you so much, and I fall on your mercy, right? You'd give them anything you want. First, you'd go, what are you up to, right? But you'd be more likely to give them what they're asking for. And that's the same thing with us fasting. As a loving parent, you would give them whatever they're asking for in that moment. And our God, our perfect heavenly father is a loving parent that's just waiting for us to ask and fast. You see, we're able to listen and hear the voice of God better. So why do we pray and fast? Well, the first reason is, is so we can hear from God clearer or better. And Acts 13, 3 tells us the other reason. 
So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The other reason is simple. It's so that God can hear from us. Do you ever feel like your prayer does not go very far when you pray? Do you ever feel like, like your, your prayer doesn't go past the ceiling or that there's like this blockage or shield between you and God? For Isaiah 58 is a chapter dedicated to fasting, and it breaks down the purposes of fasting and praying. But in Isaiah 58, the second part of verse 4 says this, You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard where? On high. Now, some translations actually translate that to in heaven, to be heard in heaven. So you see, when you pray and fast in the proper way of God, then God will hear your voice in heaven. And John Piper has this great quote. He says this, Fasting brings, helps bring God's power to our world. And I would go even further to say that fasting helps activate God's power and plan and purpose in our lives and in, our, in this world. I mean, just think back to the miracle of Dunkirk. <laughs> and, and if we really want to be a church unleashed with the power of God in our lives, in our families, in our schools, in our work, in our world, then we all need to pray and fast so that God's power will be activated. Now, now we, we have, I, I want to be very clear on this. For fasting is not a hunger strike to pressure God to give into our demands. That's not what fasting is all about. No, we are sons and daughters of our loving Heavenly Father that unplugs from things of the world to plug more into Him so that we can hear from Him and He can hear us. Now, there is some mystery here, and Scripture does not elaborate or really clarify this. I think it kind of leaves this mystery up for us to just have some mystery of the higher connection that's, that happens between our requests and what happens with God whenever we do pray and fast. We don't really know why, but it just is there. And when we have example after example after example of this in Scripture, we have example of what happens when we pray and fast. For in Nehemiah chapter 9, where the Israelites fasted and lifted up prayers of praise and confessed their sins against God. We have an example of that in Nehemiah 9. We have an example of Esther in Esther 4.16 when Esther fast with Israel and prays for the strength to ask her husband, the king, to spare Israel from Haman's plot of genocide. In Psalm 35, we have David that mentions prayer and fasting for his enemies. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel fasts and prays to lament Israel's disobedience while exiled in Babylon and asks God to have mercy on his chosen people. We have the prophet Anna, who had fasted and prayed regularly for Israel, then prophesied to Mary and Joseph about Jesus, and that's found in Luke chapter 2. Then we have Paul and Barnabas pray and fast and ask guidance to appoint elders over the first century church in Acts 14. For this is the activated, activated God's power that can be unleashed in our lives. And this unleashed power that God has for us in our lives, we see this of how, what happened in all of these examples, in Nehemiah chapter 9, God welcomed Israel back into God's arms and got all those benefits. How great would that be? King Xerxes spared Esther when he really had the right to kill her for approaching the throne without being invited. And he listened to her and he helped her rescue Israel from Haman. David doesn't materially gain anything from praying and fasting, but what it does is it reveals to the world that he truly has the heart of God. Then we have God hears Daniel's pleas, and he sends an angel to prophesy to him. Anna, in Luke chapter 2, you know what he gets, she gets to do? She gets to meet Jesus. How great would that be? And Paul and Barnabas found the men that God wanted them to appoint as elders. And the list, by the way, that's just a few examples. And the list goes on and on and on of what God does when we pray and fast. Because there is just something that happens when we combine praying and fasting. And so I'll just go ahead and give you a heads up. I was going to save this for tonight, but I'll go ahead and tell you. I want to challenge you to pray and fast sometime this week. Sometime this week. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask everybody that comes tonight to pray on Tuesday of this week. Don't ask me why Tuesday, it's just a day, okay? If you pray, or if you pray and fast on some other day, that's fine, but I'm, I'm doing it on Tuesday, and I want you to join me, because I want to see 
what God will do not only in our church, but in my life, with my family, with you all. Because I'm going to expect him to show up and show off. So I'm going to fast from food this Tuesday. Now, I'm always going to fast from social media during the week of prayer. (laughs) Always. Because I just need it. But I'm also going to fast from food, and I want to challenge you to do the same. But we need to understand that the end goal of fasting and praying is not to get something from God. For there is a time and place for that. But God is certainly not a math equation or a line of code for the computer. We don't just put together the right formula of that we pray first and then we fast and then we wait and we have attention to what God's doing and that equals God doing something extraordinary, extraordinary in our lives. It does not work that way. I mean, I love to think that, but it's not a formula. God is not a formula. And the reason for that is because God knows what I would do with that formula. If I had that formula and it worked, I would do that, do that formula in like three minutes, wouldn't you? But that's not how God works because God is a relational God. He's not a formula. He is not some vague force of power, but a, the, the most powerful person being in the universe. He is the most powerful being in all the universe, and he wants to know you and you to know him. That's how it works. And God wants and loves you and knows you so much that he wants to unleash his power, not only in this church, but also in your life. So we pray and fast. We pray and fast to hear God's voice and have God hear our voice. But let me just conclude with this last point. We pray and fast not to get something from God, but to ultimately get God himself. This is our goal. Maybe, may God be our Father and our love. May He be the first thing we think about when we, we wake up and the last thing we think of before we go to sleep. May He be our main focus in our life. May He be God in our life. But I'm here to tell you today, prayer and fasting will unleash the power of God in your life if you will pray and fast. I mean, think about this for a second. What would your world and this world look like if we all prayed and fasted like the German army is about to attack us and invade our soil? What would our prayers and our fasting look like then? And I believe, I believe that that is what we need to treat it like because we are still under attack by the evil one. And I believe that God wants to unleash his power in our lives, but we have to pray and fast. So won't you do that this week as a church? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you. We just thank you for how good you are and that you do want to know us no matter what we have done and that you want us to draw close to you and that you gave us Jesus so that we can be forgiven But Father God, how great it is that we can pray and fast and that we can can get you and that we can see your power in our life. We are so very thankful. So I pray, Lord God, that you would calm our nerves when it comes to praying and fasting. You would allow us to give us the grace to ourselves of when we mess up, but still pursue you. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the power that can be unleashed in our life, Lord. And I just pray that we would have the faith and perseverance to pray and fast this week. So we we wait expectantly on you, Lord, to do what only you can do as we come to you today. We thank you, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. But before we really conclude the service, we want to give anybody an invitation. That if you realize that you haven't really been pursuing God or doing the things of God, you've been doing the things of the world, and you realize now it's time you come back to God. It's time to come. And if it's your first time to come, we want you to come and be baptized into his name. 
So you can experience the freedom and the full life that Jesus promises, but also the experience of God in your life. Or maybe you realize that you need to rededicate your life. You need to come back to him. Or maybe you just need prayer, whatever it may be. Whatever decision that you have to make in your next step with Jesus, I can guarantee it's going to be your next best step, period. So won't you come? Won't you come as we stand and sing? Let's stand.